Well, good evening. This is Pastor Gary with another uh, Wednesday's Word. Well, and actually, this is the, the last Wednesday's Word is next week, uh, starting June 17th. Uh, we'll be starting our um, live uh, Wednesday night services back at Magnolia in Spring. Uh, at both campuses, we'll be uh, having men's and women's Bible studies uh, for the Magnolia campus. Uh, they'll be starting their Bible study for the Spring campus. We'll be finishing up the uh, Bible studies that we started before um, the uh, coronavirus shutdown. And so, uh, guys, uh, we'll be going back to uh, No More Excuses. Uh, and then, ladies, the uh, Bible study that you are cu currently uh, going through with Sophia, uh, just be ready for June 17th uh, as we come back to uh, those Bible studies. And I think for spring, I think there's about four more Bible, uh, four more lessons left in the Bible study, and then we'll go back into Wednesday night uh, word where I'll be preaching um, on that. So just look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Uh, with that being said, um, it's been it's definitely been a, a blessing to be able to connect with you uh, using this platform to continue to uh, provide encouragement and uh, just share our, you know, our hearts, Pastor Tim and I, just to share our hearts with you. Uh, and so thank you for allowing us uh, into your lives, into your homes uh, use, by using this platform. Um, tonight, I want to um, I want to focus on on something that I that I read and uh, the book is called The Decline and Fall of the Athenian Republic. And in this book, the author, uh, Alexander Fraser Teitler, uh, he wrote that nations progressed through the following sequence. And, and so uh, the sequence that he mentioned was this, and I'll put it up here so you could read that. It goes uh, that nations go from bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from great courage to uh, liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependency, from dependency to bondage. Now that's a uh, you know, and, and so you could see how um, the what the author was saying is that you know this is basically the lifeline or the progress that countries go through, that nations go through. But when I was looking at this list and and this progress, uh, the way in which they they uh, go these countries go through. I was thinking, you know, the, we go through the same kind of process in, in our lives where we are bondage and, and we do find spiritual faith. And then that leads to things and we can we can and can become complacent. And, and I think for many, they do become complacent. And, and, and how many, you know, Christians have become complacent in their Christian walk? Um, you know, where we're more concerned about self uh, than than being aware of what's going on around them. You know, where where they're more focused on their comforts instead of trying to comfort comfort those that that need the comforting. And, and so, you know, unfortunately, many of our churches are divided. Uh, you know, there's coldness and apathy that have overcome the congregation. Uh, pastors and members alike are discouraged and almost ready to give up. You know, new religious ideas, and I say new religious ideas, but they're 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 not new. They're just new to people, and, and, and so they. Uh, seem to be taken over and as churches you know we are desperate we're in desperate need for a great opportunity of the Holy Spirit you know I was, I'm reading uh, the biography of, of Charles Spurgeon and you know he was part of the there his church uh, was part of the Baptist Union in the 1800s in London and um, there was this when Darwin's theory of evolution came about a lot of the preachers and a lot of the pulpits started talking about uh, uh, evolution and 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 trying to ingrain that into into the into Christianity, and many weren't willing to take a stand. Charles Spurgeon did, and and you know his his reputation paid for it, but he felt that and he knew that you know his convictions were stronger and more important and, and, and than his reputation. And we too, as Christians, have to take that stand. We can't say that that the Holy Spirit and, and God's Word is a suggestion. Uh, it, it's the inherent Word of God. There, it's infallible. There are no there are no false statements in the Bible, and that's what Charles Spurgeon was willing to do. He took the stand. And for many of us, we just become complacent to that. We've we've become comfortable with saying it's okay. You can think the way you want to think. Well, no. Uh, false doctrine is false doctrine, and and unfortunately, we've just become apathetic to that. It's like, eh, whatever people want to do, you know, you're okay, I'm okay, we're okay. 
And, and so tonight, I just want to talk about revival. What do we need to do to just inject revival within us? What does that look like? And, and so before we get dive deep into God's word, uh, let's take a moment and, and go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I just thank you for just uh, the opportunity to come today, Father. Father, I pray that you open our hearts to your word, Father. Father, I pray that you just minister to each one of us, Father. Father, I pray for, for those that are... Uh, just going through grief right now, Father. Just, uh, you know, you, you see, the, we see the emails, Father, of, uh, you know, members and, and, and uh, loved ones losing mem losing people, Father. Uh, and I pray that you just, uh, just comfort them where they are, Father. Let them find uh, just comfort in you and your arms, Father. Father, I pray for uh, the, for the, you know, for them having to go through to get arrangements and, and setting funerals and, and, and all that, Father, I pray that you just go before them, Father. Father, we just lift up tonight's message to you, Father. Father, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. And, and so, uh, like I was saying, you know, as a church, we are in desperate need for, uh, of a great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. What we need is revival. Amen. And I believe the second Chronicles seven offers us hope for revival. And so before we get into our scripture text for this evening, uh, I want to set the backdrop. So this is, you know, at the time when King Solomon had just this, dedicated the temple and, and God spoke to him. And I want to spend time in, in, at, in chapter seven of Second Chronicles and specifically uh, verse 14. And so Second Chronicles chapter seven, verse 14 says this. And my people who are called by my name, hum humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. Let me read that again. And my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven. I will, for will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Amen. You see, so really I want to look at three things. The first thing is that revival must begin with God's people. In that verse we read, if my people who are called by my name, this promise is given to God's people. It's not given to the government. It's not given to Wall Street. It's not given to Hollywood. It is given to the true believers of Jesus Christ. To see revival, it begins in the lives of people who have a personal relation with God through his son, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, revival always came when God's people turned from their sin and began to seek after the Lord with all their heart. You see, revival, uh, it, it will ultimately have an impact on society, but it begins with God's people. In the New Testament, the promise of the Spirit was given to God's people. The Spirit was not given to the world, but to believers. The lost cannot know the Holy Spirit. John 7, 37 through 39 says this. Now, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from, this, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive this, to receive for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. See, revival will not begin in the White House. It, it will and must begin in the church house. And we are the church. The believers of Jesus are the church. When God's people earnestly seek his face, that's when revival begins, when we seek God's face. You know, throughout history, there have been ebbs and flows uh, when it comes to people seeking God's face. When things were going well, people would become complacent, just like today. You know, you had, that was, that 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 is what was going on before the, the first great awakening, the second great awakening, that people got comfortable. They got complacent. They didn't think it was that big of a deal. They, they got comfortable in the things they were doing and, and their daily routine of, you know, their, their routine of the day. And they forgot the importance of seeking, of daily seeking God's face. So ultimately, uh, things would, you know, would appear to be beyond, beyond hope, beyond, beyond, you know, us being able to fix it. And that is when God would raise up a prophet to preach to the people. People would begin to seek the Lord and God would pour out his spirit once more and revival would come to the people. See, I believe God is moving people today to seek his face. 
The second thing is we must pray for revival. It's not just going to happen. We have to pray for revival. Revival praying may only begin with just a few people. But that's how anything starts. It starts with one. It starts with one person seeking God's face. And then it spreads. because, And then others will join in in, uh, in that prayer. Let's look at our text again. And my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. See, we read the kind of prayer that is needed today. Today, There must be humility in, in our prayer. Now, it's not a prayer to for us to be humble, to be humble. It, it, that's not what the, that verse is saying. It's not saying we should pray to be humble. What it's saying is we are told to humble ourselves and pray. That's what we should do. Humility and prayer recognizes the emphasis of our the, emphasis, the emptiness on our lives, in our lives, and the need for restoration with our first love. There must be earnestness in our prayer. We have to pray with conviction. We have to pray. We have to pray with a purpose. Revival praying is is not much. Is not so much praying for God to do something. It says right there in the verse. It says, "Seek my face." It is seeking the Lord himself. The Bible tells us over and over again to seek God. Hosea 10, 12 says, for it is time to seek the Lord. Isaiah 55, 6, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Jeremiah 29, 13 through, 13, uh, 13 through 14, you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. Jesus himself says in Matthew 7, 7, seek and you will find. It is not his blessings we seek. It is not his gifts we seek. It is the Lord himself that we should be seeking. The third thing, the, the third component of this type of, of revival prayer is there must be repentance in our prayer. Verse 14 says that we must turn from, the, 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 turn from their wicked ways. Though the word repentance is not new, used in, in that text, it is certainly described in this verse. Repentance is not just feeling sorry for our sin. It is turning from our sin. It is doing it about face. It's making a U-turn. We are to turn away from our sin and towards God. Ultimately, revival is based upon God's promises. In verse 14, uh, it contains three promises for those who seek the Lord with all their hearts. God promises that I will hear from heaven. Does it seem at times that, that heaven, is a, heaven has turned a deaf ear to you? Or, or, or better question is, how long has it been since you have heard from the Lord? And I would answer this with, I would answer those questions with, when was the last time that you sought God's face? Not for things but that you earnestly sought his face. Or, you know, are you just, when you pray, are you just praying for things? God, get me out of this situation. God, just deliver me from this. God, if I could just get that job. Instead of God, your will be done. God, search my heart. If there's any areas where, where I've failed you, if there's any sin that I haven't confessed, show that to me. When was the last time you prayed that? See, when we really seek him, he says, I will hear from heaven. First John uh, 5, 14 through 15 tells us that this is the confidence which we have before him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we can have requests which we have asked from him. But it's all according to his will. God promises that he will forgive our sin. It says, I will forgive their sin. See, because sin destroys our fellowship with God. It creates a barrier between us and God. It's not God creating that barrier. It's us creating that barrier with the sin. Because we're choosing sin over the relation, our relationship with God. Because again, we've become complacent. We get comfortable. We think it's okay. We alibi it. But we need to confess those things that separate us from God. 
The good news is that God has provided a way for us to be forgiven. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. To forgive means to send forth or to send away. It also means to cancel a debt. This It involves the complete removal of the offense based on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. God promised a third promise, and this third promise in this verse is that I will heal their land. See, revival may be a painful experience at first because it involves brokenness. It involves contrition, confession, repentance. But the result of revival is changed lives. The result of revival is a revived church. And that's where you have the impact on society. That's where the revival starts within us. And then we it, it just out it comes out of us. And lives are changed because we're we're not ashamed to share the gospel. And people are knowing and accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit brings healing to the body of Christ. And after that healing, it goes out into the land. There's nothing that we can do right. There's nothing that we can do to right the wrongs of our country. Except go to the Lord and pray for revival within us. Only God can do that when we humble, our, humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face, and repent. That is when God will hear from heaven, forgive our sin, and heal our land. Listen to what the psalmist prayed in Psalms 85, 6. Will you not yourself revive us again, that your people may rejoice in you? Revival can't start, can't begin anywhere. Unless it starts in you first. It starts in us first. It has to start in me. So do we need a revival? Yes, absolutely. The question is, are you ready for revival? Are you ready to pray that prayer for revival? I ask that you, you would join me in prayer that revival start, that it began within each of us. Let's pray. Father God. Father, I do pray, Father. Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy, Father. I, I thank you that we have this platform that we can come in and seek your face, Father. We can oh, just get on our knees, Father. Fall on our face and ask you to search us, Father. Search us out, Father. Father, so that we can confess, Father, our sins, Father. So that you can forgive us, Father. So, Father, that our relationship can be right with you, Father. Father, I pray, Father. I pray that we each earnestly seek your face, Father, that we spend time in your word, Father, that we spend time with uh, people, Father, that to share your word with them, Father, and Father, that people will come to know you as, as their Lord and Savior, Father. Father, I thank you for all that you do in our lives, Father. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen. Well, again, like I said earlier at the beginning, this is our last Wednesday word uh, this way, uh, using this platform as far as, uh, um, you know, uh, coming to you every Wednesday night, Pastor Tim and I, but know that we will be, uh, having a Wednesday night service, uh, at both the spring and the Magnolia campus. And, uh, I can't wait to see you at those Bible studies, Magnolia praying for you as you start your Bible study, uh, continue to pray for the Bible studies that are going on, on here at the spring campus. And uh, also, uh, Children's, Start, Children's Church will pick up at both locations this Sunday. Um, and so be sure to contact Jenny over at Magnolia, Pastor Matt over at Spring. Uh, parents, if you're not yet comfortable uh, having your children go to the Children's Church, that's okay. Uh, packets will still be available in the main foyer area or the lobby as you go in uh, into the church before you go into the sanctuary so they could continue to sit with you. Uh, you know, we, the main thing is we want you to feel comfortable uh, so that you're not worried about those outside distractions and you're able just to spend time with God uh, at, at our church service. Uh, with that being said, uh, God bless and see you on Sunday.